يوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة أيحسب الإنسان أن لن نجمع عذامه بلا قادرين على أن نسوي بنانة بل يريد الإنسان ليفجر أمامه يسأل أيان يوم القيامة فإذا برق البصر وخسف القمر وجمع الشمس والقمر يقول الإنسان يومئذ أين المفر كلا لا وزر إلى ربك يومئذ المستقر ينبأ الإنسان يومئذ بما قدم وأخر بل الإنسان على نفسه بصيرة ولو ألقى معاذيرة لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به إن علينا جمعه وقرآنه فإذا قرأناه فاتبع قرآنه ثم إن علينا بيانه كلا بل تحبون العاجلة وتذرون الآخرة وجوه يومئذ ناظرة إلى ربها ناظرة ووجوه يومئذ باسرة تظن أن يفعل بها فاقرة كلا إذا بلغت الرتراقي وقيل من راق وذن أنه الفراق والتفت الساق بالساق إلى ربك يومئذ المساق فلا صدق ولا صلى ولكن كذب وتولى ثم ذهب إلى أهله يتمطى أولى لك فأولى ثم أولى لك فأولى أيحسب الإنسان أن يترك سدى ألم يكن نطفة من مني يمنى ألم يكن نطفة تم من مني يمنى ثم كان علقة فخلق فسوى فجعل منه الزوجين الذكر والأنثى أليس ذلك بقادر على أن يحيي الموتى صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات So yesterday in, in Madrasa, uh, class Maytham, yeah? Maytham and Salman, um, we did, uh, we talked about Imam Jafar Sadiq's, uh, the political situation at the time um, of his lifetime before and just after. We talked about some of his um, contributions towards science 
some of his contributions to philosophy, some of his contribution to uh, religion, you know, the, 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 the uh, um, uh, Islamic, yeah, Islamic jurisprudence. So Adnan um, yesterday talked about his contribution about science. So um, he wants a few minutes just to sort of share those with you. So please welcome him with a salwat. Assalamu alaikum. So as that said, I'll be talking a bit about uh, his contributions to science in uh, Islam. <clears throat> so during the golden era of Islam, which was uh, a time when Islamic civilization experienced great progress uh, and achievements from the 8th to the 14th century, uh, it was a period of cultural, great cultural, scientific, and uh, intellectual advancements in Islam. And Imam Jafar Sadiq played a huge part in this golden age. Um, specifically, he provided insights in fields like astronomy, chemistry, medicine, and mathematics. Uh, and his work laid the foundation for the findings that we have today. So, inshallah, I'll talk a little bit about each uh, topic. So, firstly, he um, played a huge com uh, contribution in astronomy. So he studied things like uh, space, like the stars, the planets, the moons, the asteroids, and the galaxies. Uh, and he was, he was observing the uh, cycles of the moons and the movements and its phases and, you know, like um, the half moon, the full moon. Uh, he was also observing the sun's movements, so the daily rising and the, and the setting and the path across the sky and its changing positions throughout the years. Uh, and he observed the movements of planets. So, again, the paths across the sky, the motion, and the interaction with other planets. Um, he, the reason why he did all these findings was to, um, was to determine prayer times for fasting in Ramzan. Uh, and again, his work laid a, laid a foundation for further advancements in uh, astronomy. And then another huge part he played, played was uh, in chemistry. Um, so he was looking for substances uh, to try and um, transform uh, base metals with like worthless metals or not very valuable metals to try and turn them into metals like gold and silver. Uh, he was also, I'm not sure how, this, how accurate the source is, but uh, it talked about how there was a, a search for the Philosopher's Stone, which is basically a... Um, how do I say this? It's like a, it's like a, um, like a substance he tried to sort after, which he wanted to try and um, increase uh, spirituality, spiritual enlightenment, and uh, increase uh, life expectancy. Whilst he wasn't successful in that, uh, it, his work again played a huge role in today's findings of chemistry. And then his next part was maths. So he came up with algebra, and he was one that uh, focused on teachings like solving equations, like puzzles, uh, and working with polynomials, and also, which are like, like uh, finding like the X, I'm sure the kids know, like finding X in a solution. He came up with that. Uh, he also taught basic arithmetic, so like addition, multiplication, subtract, subtraction, and division. Um, and thanks for his contributions, uh, algebra became a very important area of math, which is still studied today. Uh, and then finally, his findings in medicine. So he did a lot of research in finding ways to diagnose and treat illnesses through natural remedies, so made from like plants. And he also uh, studied and emphasized the importance of taking care of one's health. Uh, and again, these findings and ideas influenced what a lot of scholars and doctors uh, in the world talk about today. So I hope that was useful. A bit about uh, his scientific findings. Salwat.
Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. If you could kindly open your Qurans to chapter number nine, Surah At Tauba, verse one hundred and twenty-two. Chapter number 9, Surah at tauba verse 122. We'll also be looking at three ahadith tonight in particular. And inshallah, they will come up on your screen. And the idea is that you will also read them and try to make sense of them with me, inshallah. For the love of our sixth Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad as-Sadiq, let us have a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وما كان المؤمنون لينفروا كافة فلولا نفر من كل فرقة منهم طائفة ليتفقهوا في الدين ولينذروا قومهم إذا رجعوا إليهم لعلهم يحذرون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل Awaited Savior of Humanity Imam Al-Mahdi عليه السلام My respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Our gathering this evening is to commemorate the martyrdom anniversary of our sixth holy Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad as-Sadiq, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhima. We extend our condolences to the Imam of our time, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ziyara of Imam as-Sadiq alayhi salam fi dunya wal-akhirah. The length of the imamat of our sixth Imam alayhi salam was approximately 34 years. Famously, we hear that our sixth Imam alayhi salam had some 4,000 students. This is a term or a phrase that has become quite famous on the manabir, on the pulpits. Where does this come from? Our earliest scholars captured the number of narrators from our sixth Imam alayhi salam and because they were learning the ahadith of the imam and spreading the ahadith of the imam this became a famous turn of phrase where the narrators became students of the imam and of course anyone who's learning the ahadith of the imam is no doubt a student of the imam Shaykh al-Tusi stated that there were some 3,200 narrators of ahadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam and Shaykh al-Mufid stated that there were 4,000 narrators of ahadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam and this is where this term famously comes from that the sixth Imam has 4,000 students at his time why is this significant? what if I told you that we have a sahih hadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam that says Two Imams earlier, two Imams earlier at the time of our fourth Imam alayhi salam, the Shia didn't even know what was halal and what was haram. Think about what I've just said. There is a sahih narration, so the chain of narration is considered to be sahih, sound, impeccable that we can trust the narrators who have stated this hadith. From the sixth Imam, alayhi salam, who says 
that his grandfather's time, that of Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, the Shia, did not even know what was halal or what was haram. Yet, by the time it comes to the sixth Imam alayhi salam's time, so much has shifted where maybe we have 4,000 narrators from the Imam such that the knowledge of the Shia has reached an incredible level of awareness and insight. What I want to be able to do tonight, inshallah, is inspect and analyze those narrations. I want to present to you the narration that says, before Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, the Shi'as didn't even have knowledge of halal and haram. And I want to show you that during the time of the sixth Imam, how far and significant the situation had changed, where now the Shia of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam were not only the leaders of knowledge, but the entirety of the Ummah turned to the Shia for their knowledge. And I want to show you this within the space of maybe three or four ahadith. So, inshallah, Adnan is going to present some of the ahadith that we're going to discuss on the screen. And I want to be able to start with this hadith that I mentioned, that our sixth imam states that there was a period when the Shia didn't even know the basics of their religion. When we say halal and haram, that's the most basic fundamentals of the things that are, we are responsible for. Food that is halal and haram, we are responsible for. Whether lying is permitted or not, these are basics, these are halal and haram, correct? I don't know if the hadith is up on the screen, it is it? You can see it? Okay. And at the time of our Imam alayhi salam, there was a period when the Shia didn't even know this. As I read and translate the hadith for you, I want you to answer the question, why would this be the case that the Shia of the fourth Imam's time didn't even know their halal and haram? This is the question I'm going to ask you, inshallah. You can all see the hadith? Yes? Okay, let's read it together. It's a part of a much longer hadith, and I've just taken a snippet of the hadith for you. Hadith comes to us from our sixth Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallamu alayhi And he says the following: "Wa kana al-Shi'a qabla an yakuna Abu Ja'far alayhi salam." The situation of the Shi'a before that of, of Abu Ja'far. Who is Abu Ja'far? Ahsan, fifth Imam. So, father of Ja'far. وَكَانَتِ الشِّيْعَةُ The Shia, قَبْلَ أَنْ يَكُونَ أَبُو جَعْفَرٍ Before the time of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. So, who comes before Imam al-Baqir? Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam. هُمْ لَا يَعْرِفُونَ مَنَاسِكَ حَجِّهِمْ they didn't know the laws of Hajj. وَحَلَالَهُمْ وَحَرَامَهُمْ They didn't know their halal and they didn't know their haram. That's quite a statement, isn't it? You would normally expect that the Shia would be close to an Imam, would know their duties and responsibilities. But a ma'soom Imam is saying that only two generations before him, his own Shia didn't even know their halal and haram. وَكَانَتِ الشِّيْعَةُ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَكُونَ أَبُوْ جَعْفَرٍ وَهُمْ لَا يَعْرِفُونَ مَنَاسِكَ حَجِّهِمْ وَحَلَالَهُمْ وَحَرَامَهُمْ Now here, there's a grammatical point that I need to make. Someone may translate this hadith and say, they don't know, لَا يَعْرِفُونَ مَنَاسِكَ حَجِّهِمْ The manasik of hajj. وَحَلَالَهُمْ وَحَرَامَهُمْ They're halal and haram. And ask, does the halal and haram refer to the manasik of hajj? For example, when a person enters into the state of ihram, there are 25 things that are haram for you, correct? You cannot look in the mirror, 
in order to beautify yourself. You cannot crush an insect or any animal and so on and so forth. It doesn't refer to this because the Arabic language has a particular grammar. It would have said halaluha wa haramuha if it was referring to the manasik of Hajj. It's not. It's saying the Shia didn't know the manasik of Hajj nor did they even know their halal and haram. Now comes the next part of the hadith. Hatta kana Abu Ja'farin alayhi salam fataha lahum wa bayyana lahum manasika hajjihim wa halalahum wa haramahum. Until whom came? Our fifth Imam Abu Ja'far al-Baqir salawatullahu wa salamuhu alayhi. Allahumma salli ala muhammad. فَفَتَحَ لَهُمْ He opened up for them this knowledge. وَبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ مَنَاسِكَ حَجِّهِمْ وَحَلَالَهُمْ وَحَرَامُهُمْ And he made clear and known the commands of what was halal and haram for them. Now look at this next part of this same hadith. حَتَّى Until when? صَارَ النَّاسُ يَحْتَاجُونَ إِلَيْهِمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا كَانُوا يَحْتَاجُونَ إِلَى النَّاسِ Until a time came when the people needed them the same way they, the Shia, were in need of the people. Before the time of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, the Shia were in need of the people. What does it mean, an-nas? It means the non-Shia. So all the non-Shias, with their imams, with their knowledge, with their books, with their narrators, the Shia relied and required knowledge from the non-Shia in order to know what was halal and haram, to know what was the manasik of hajj. When Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam comes, فَتَحَ لَهُمْ وَبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ He opens this door of knowledge. He makes clear to them this knowledge. And now, حَتَّى صَارَ النَّاسُ يَحْتَاجُونَ إِلَيْهِمْ The people are now in need of the knowledge of the Shia to the same extent that beforehand the Shia were in need of the knowledge of the non-Shia. Incredible hadith, isn't it? We don't normally hear this, or we don't normally know this or think about this. Is it the first time you're hearing this hadith? Very interesting, isn't it? So I ask you a question. Why do you think this hadith, what, what do you think this hadith is telling us? Why during or before the time of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam were the Shia in such a state of paucity of knowledge, reliance on others for their Islamic knowledge? And what specifically was happening to the Imam of their time? Ahsan. Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam was so much confined under a house arrest of type whereby he couldn't preach openly, normally for the majority of time. And as a result, the Shia had a lack of access to the Imam and the Imam's time was spent more maybe on things like making sure people knew what happened in Karbala, making sure people knew things like Sahifa Sajjadiyya, making sure people knew things like Rasalat al huquq But when it came to the fiqh of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam, he could not teach halal and haram. And he could not teach the manasik of hajj. Why? Because, of course, Hajj as a public gathering of significance, you can bet your bottom dollar that there's no way Banu Abbas would have, uh, Banu Umayyah would have allowed Imam al Sajjad alayhi salam to have a presence in Hajj when the entirety of the Ummah is gathering. Who is the person that they would most want to lock up to make sure he doesn't participate publicly? Our fourth Imam, Zainul Abideen, salawatullahu salamuhu alayhi. Allahumma salli alayhi. Can you see 
what's happening? Or you can see that from the time of the fourth Imam to the fifth Imam's time, something huge occurs, doesn't it? Not only is knowledge being spread, but that the Shia are now being taught at such a level that the people are requiring the Shia to the same extent that the Shia previously were reliant on people. Khair. Open your Qur'ans. Chapter number 9, Surat at Tawbah, verse 122. Jazakumullah khair. Now, having heard this hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, that prior to Imam al Baqir alayhi salam, the Shia didn't even have knowledge of their halal and haram, we have to just go back into the Quran and see that it is wajib for a group of people to have enough knowledge to be able to warn their communities. How much knowledge is required? Enough to be able to warn their communities of what? Allah, Prophet, Imam, Halal, Haram, duties, responsibilities. Have a look at the ayah. Verse 122, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. وَمَا كَانَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لِيَنْفِرُوا كَافَّةً It is not befitting that the believers should go forth to war all together in their entirety. Let us say that there is a war. If all of us go, who's going to defend the bar? Who's going to defend the city? Some of us have different duties across the needs of the ummah. So it was not required for everyone to go to war when the Prophet was trying to rouse people to be able to defend the Muslim ummah. And this ayah in particularly defend them from the Romans that were encroaching upon the Muslim community. وَمَا كَانَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لِيَنْفِرُوا كَافَّةً It does not befit the believers in their entirety to all go forth towards war. فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ A group from every party should go forth and learn the depth of religion. So, a group from every group goes forth. So if you have here a community, there has to be a group of people from this community, whether it be Bab or the wider Leeds community, has to go forward in order to gain knowledge. And if there is a community or group of communities in Bradford, in Birmingham, in London, and so on and so forth, every group must have a portion who go forth and study and learn the depth of religion. Why? Read the rest of the ayah. فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ A company from every group should go forward and learn. Learn what? لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ The depth of knowledge in their religion. Why? وَلِيُنْذِرُ قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ So that they may warn their people when they return back from learning that knowledge. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ So that the group may protect themselves. So, one, two, five from every community must go forth, learn, and come back in order to warn you, to make sure that you have enough knowledge. It could be, for example, Adnan goes, Tariq Bai goes, so on and so forth, and they come back and warn you about what is right, what is wrong, what is halal, what is haram. This is known as wajib kifai. Wajib kifai means what? That a s- enough portion of people fulfill an act so the rest of us don't have to do it. God forbid if there's a mayyit here tomorrow, do all of you have to perform the ghusl of mayyit? Well, so long as one person has taken care of the duty, the rest of you are free from that duty. This is called wajib kifai. Similarly, a group from amongst us has to go and learn deen in order to come back and warn the rest of us. Think about this very carefully. 
put the hadith and the ayah together. If there are Shia at the time of Imam al Sajjad, we're not talking about one, two Shia, the majority of Shia do not even know the halal and haram, do not know the monastic of Hajj, based on this ayah, what has to be done? A significant investment in teaching has to occur. Correct? Not just that, they have to have لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ A depth of knowledge of the religion so that they can warn the rest of the people. So that they can actually have enough knowledge to be able to share it with others when they go abroad. You understand? Okay. Having seen these two points, I want to show you some interesting ahadith. So I brought with me a book called Imam Ali and Political Leadership. Okay, I'm going to read to you one hadith, and this will help us contextualize part of the hadith that we have read from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. What did Imam Sadiq alayhi salam say? That prior to Imam al Baqir alayhi salam, the Shia did not know their monastic of the Hajj, their halal, and their haram. Okay. So this hadith comes to us from Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahu salamuhu alayhi. Imam Ali alayhi salam in Nahj al letter number 67 writes this and he writes it to Qutham ibn Abbas who is Qutham ibn Abbas? Qutham ibn Abbas his full name Qutham ibn Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib so who is he? who is Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib in relation to the Prophet? Abdul Muttalib's son, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Who is that? The uncle of the Prophet. So, Qutham is the son of Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, making Qutham what? Cousin to the Prophet. Imam Ali alayhi salam writes to Qutham ibn Abbas. He says the following. He was the Wakil of Imam Ali alayhi salam in Mecca. He says to him, establish the Hajj, set up the needs of Hajj. So what might be the needs? For example, making sure that everything is organized, food, water. If you need to perform the slaughter at Hajj, there's enough sheep in the area of Mina and so on and so forth. Set up the Hajj for the people. And remind them of these days which are supposed to be devoted to Allah. Sit, give audience in the mornings and in the evenings, and explain the laws of Hajj to anyone who asks. Teach the ignorant and discuss with the learned. Imam Ali salam is telling his representative in Mecca, teach people Hajj. Imam Ali salam, Imam Hassan alayhi salam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. In the span of one, two, three Imams, we go from having an Imam saying, teach people Hajj, to the Shia not even knowing how to perform Hajj. Very interesting, isn't it? Okay, let's move forward. Adnan's going to show us another hadith, and this hadith will explain again further a little bit more the first hadith about the not being Shia who understand. So the Shia don't know the monastic of Hajj, used to be taught to them by Qutham ibn Abbas. Then what happens? Imam al-Baqir comes and changes the situation whereby now the people are in need of the knowledge of the Shia. The hadith is there? Brilliant. Read this hadith with me. Qala Imam al-Baqir salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi Imam al-Baqir says, he says to one of his companions, 
ageless fi masjid al madina sit in the masjid of medina which masjid is this main masjid masjid nabawi so that's the main masjid of the whole city thousands of people are coming ijlis fi masjid al madina wa aftin nas issue fatwa to the people fa inni uhibbu an yura fi shi'ati mithlak for i love to see amongst my shi'a examples like you think about these two hadith prior to imam al baqir alayhi salam the shi'a didn't even know halal and haram imam al baqir alayhi salam teaches them to the extent that the shi'a can now not only be resource for knowledge imam al baqir alayhi salam says ijlis fi masjid al madina he tells one of his companions you sit in the main masjid wa aftin nas and issue fatwa to people can you see how far they've come how far have they come do you think how far a long way just think about this in the space of maybe 20 years Imam al baqir alayhi salam has opened up so much knowledge to certain people that they are now having gone from no knowledge to such significant levels of knowledge that they can actually issue fatawa on behalf of Imam al baqir alayhi salam. Isn't that incredible? Can you see the direction of change amongst the Shia at that time? Last hadith. You're earning your wage today. Yeah? Last hadith. This hadith comes to us from our sixth Imam Ja'far al Sadiq, Salawatullah wa Salam Hu Aday. Allahumma salla ala. Ya Aban, there's four great companions of Imam, al- Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. One of them is called Aban bin Taghlib. Ya Aban, O oh Aban, Nadir Ahl al Medina, issue opinions to the people of Medina. For inni uhibbu an yakuna mithlaka. Min warati, min rawati wa rijali. Issue fatwa, issue opinions to the people of Medina. For I love that there is your example from amongst my narrators and amongst my followers. So it's a similar hadith to the previous one, isn't it? Previously, the companion of Imam al Baqir was told sit inside the masjid of Medina and issue fatawa. This time Imam is saying, generally, give opinion. And I, I want you to give it to Ahl al Medina, to the people of the city, which is the same thing basically. Why is this important? Well, just purely from a historical perspective, if you start to see these three, four ahadith, you can see a trend that is taking place in the history. The time of the fourth Imam, Shia has no knowledge. The fifth Imam teaches them so much that people are now in need of them. The fifth Imam can tell his companions, issue fatawa. The sixth Imam can tell people, issue fatawa. Do you think that's where it ended? What happened was that the sixth Imam alayhi salam would tell not just one companion, go and issue fatawa. He trained a significant number of companions to such an extent 
that they could do the ijtihad on his behalf and not only in the city of Medina, in the entirety of the ummah. This is very significant. He says one, you sit inside Medina. He sends another, for example, to Kufa. He sends another, for example, to Qum. Now think about this carefully. If Imam al-Sadiq has trained three companions, one to stay here, one to go there, one to go there, are all of these companions the same age? Are all of them the same merit? Are all of them the same knowledge? What do you think? No, they can't be, right? I'll give you an example. One of the great companions of the name of Muslim, uh, Muhammad ibn Muslim. Muhammad ibn Muslim says, I learned 30,000 hadith from Imam al Baqir and 16,000 hadith from Imam al Sadiq. So now one companion is sitting in Medina, one companion is sitting in Kufa, one companion is sitting in Qum. They've all learned slightly different levels of knowledge from Imam al-Sadiq Imam al-Baqir When someone came to Imam al-Sadiq and asked, what do I do with this issue of khums? It may have been that you were sitting listening, but it may be that you were not. You were present that day, he was not. So with the training that you had, the knowledge of the Qur'an, the knowledge of the ahadith, the knowledge of the way Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam would issue fatawa, once he has trained you, he then sends you to different parts of the ummah and says, do this ijtihad on my behalf. You represent me on my behalf. And this is the key point. Nazir, you live in Medina. Akil, you live in Kufa. Nazir, the representative of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam is Tariq Bahi. So when you have a question about halal and haram, where are you going to go? Ahsad, you're going to go to Tariq Anku. And Akil lives in Kufa. If you need to get knowledge, where are you going to go? To which representative? Is it possible that these two might give slightly different answers? Yes, yes or no? Yes. yes. Why is it possible that they might give slightly two different answers? Well, number one, they don't ma'asum either of them. So his understanding of the question, his understanding of the question might be slightly different. Is it possible that they both heard the hadith from Imam? Is it possible that they both not heard the hadith from the Imam? Yes. It could be that Akil raises a question. It could be that Nazir raises a question that the representatives haven't heard before. So now both representatives have to dig deep and do the ijtihad based on my knowledge of the Quran, based on my knowledge of Imam al-Baqir's hadith, based on my knowledge of Imam Sadiq's hadith, this is what I think the Imam would have said. Or he says, well actually I know that the Imam said this, and so you issue one hadith, you haven't heard the hadith, you won't be able to issue the hadith, you stay silent. It might be that their questions have slightly different nuances. It might be the same issue, they're both asking about khums, but they might have two different Issues. Either way, at that time, there was a slightly different answer coming from the representative in Medina, a slightly different answer coming from Kufa, and a slightly different answer coming from Qom, a slightly different answer coming from Mecca, a slightly different answer coming from Yemen, a slightly different answer coming from Misr, a slightly, a slightly, a slightly. Why is this important? How is it relevant to the current time? Because we tend to question our murtia. Mm. If this murtia has got a different ruling on that, and especially when it comes to Eid, we should all be united. 
It's always about Eid, isn't it? It's always, go, always goes back to Eid, doesn't it? Well, I'll take the first half of your answer. The marajah differ on their fatawa, correct? Some of them have a slightly different interpretation of the same hadith. Imam al-Baqir said X. Imam al-Sadiq said Y. But both of them slightly understand the hadith differently. No problem. One uses this principle of interpretation, another one uses this principle of interpretation. Did you know that this used to happen at the time of Imam al-Sadiq on the say-so of Imam al-Sadiq Had he wanted there to be one point of reference only, he would have said it, only come to Ja'far al-Sadiq in order to get fatawa. He didn't. He said, oh Aban, you sit inside Masjid Kufa, or sit inside uh, Medina and you give fatawa. And then he sent another companion to a different area and another companion to a different area. And with your level of knowledge, you were issuing fatawa on behalf of Imam al-Sadiq with your level of knowledge and with yours and with yours and with yours, each great companion, not every companion, only those companions that were given license were able to issue fatawa on behalf of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. But they all gave slightly different answers based on the knowledge that they had, which they had learned from either Imam al-Baqir or Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet today when marajit slightly differ, some people jump up and down, not being able to understand. How can they differ on the knowledge of Imam Sadiq? The companions used to differ on the knowledge of Imam Sadiq during his lifetime. What do you think 1300 years later? Yet people get so upset over a difference of knowledge, a difference of opinion between Mujtahideen. Number one. Let's take a second conclusion. And this one's the controversial one. But I don't mind saying it here. Because I know you will understand. Think about this very carefully. During the time of the life of the Imam, he told companions, you go to this city, you go to this city, you go to this city, and you issue fatawa. Was Akil meant to come all the way to Medina in order to be able to get fatawa? And was Nazir meant to go all the way to Kufa and get fatawa? Yes or no? No. Doesn't make sense, does it? If you're in your city, receive knowledge from the one who is local to you. If you're in your city, receive knowledge from the one who is local to you. You might not recall this, but I mentioned in both the program for Imam al-Hadi and in Muharram gone that Imam al-Hadi set up the wukala system and he used to tell his own Shia do not come and ask me questions go and ask the representative in your city I don't know if you remember this there's one hadith I mentioned where the companions went to visit Imam al Hussein on ziyarah en route they stopped off to meet Imam al-Hadi and he said to them, if you had just gone to ask the question from your wakil, you would have received the reward of visiting Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam used to discourage people to come to him because he wanted to establish the wukala system. Now this one is the controversial one. We only seem to be allowed to do taqlid of people living in one or two cities. Najaf, Qom, maybe Karbala, maybe in Beirut. What was the methodology of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam? Go and seek knowledge, go and do taqlid, yani go and seek answers, fatawa, from person in Medina or person in your city? Why? Ahsantum. You're asking a question to my representative. He knows what's happening in your city. He knows what's happening in your region. Probably because you're both Shia, he actually knows you personally. If he's my wakil, he collects the khums, 
he issues the fatawa, he knows what's going on locally, and we have Shia that are mutadayin, religious, they're going to come to him regularly. He's going to know this person, isn't he? Who better to answer you your question than the one who is local to you? Are you allowed to do the taqlid of someone local today? Is there even the discussion? Well, there is. But normally what you get told is, you must do taqlid of the one who is a'lam, the one who is most knowledgeable. That's not the way of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam The way of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam was, go to the mujtahid in your city, in your local area, because that person is trained and he knows what the rulings are in accordance with your locality, your circumstance. It's a conversation for another day. But if we're being loyal to the methodology of a hadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam it's a very different system than to the one that is set up. Conclusion number two. Conclusion number three. This one again might be a bit, not controversial, but pointing towards important issues. The ayah said, don't let everyone go to war. Correct? Yeah. A group from amongst you should go and learn لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ so that you may return and warn and give back knowledge, correct? The challenge we have right now, significantly, is that in a number of our communities, they don't have resident ulama. And even in larger communities, there definitely isn't resident alimat. The sisters who can lead for the causes and the needs of the sisters. In some communities, we don't have resident ulama. So every week, they're having to just invite someone just to come and do one-off lectures. No spiritual guidance, presence, long-term vision, long-term planning with the community. Whereas the ayah said, and what Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam did, and what Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam did, was make sure that when there was a lack they immediately went out and trained a significant number of people. How many people with Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam? According to Shaykh al Tusi, 3,200. According to Shaykh al Mufid, 4,000 narrators, of which Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam could pick a handful and say, You go to this city, you go to this city, you go to this city. So every major Shi'i city had resident alim, or actually higher than that, had fuqaha, mujtahideen. But we haven't invested in our communities enough to be able to send people to have knowledge and come back. This is why that there is a lack in some communities. For years, in fact, in some communities. Where is the structure? Where is the leadership? Where is the guidance? Where are our organizations? Where are the wukala of the maraji here in this country that are supposed to know what's going on in order to be able to assess whether there is a paucity of knowledge, a lack in major cities, in order to be able to send. Can you see? If we don't have enough resident ulama, enough mujtahideen, enough resident alimat, then what happens? Over a period of generation, there will be a lack of knowledge of what is halal and what is haram. And we end up being in the sticky situation similar to the Shia of our fourth Imam alayhi salam. You can see when we say al-Baqir, the one who split open knowledge, and Ja'far al-Sadiq who is the head of the Ja'fari school of thought, systematizing knowledge, it's more than simply saying that he set up knowledge for people. It is more than simply saying he taught medicine, he taught philosophy, he taught astronomy, he taught this, he taught that. He got to the point where he was able to send out mujtahideen to every major city in the entirety of the ummah, such that none of those cities went, be out, be out, went without. Bil Akis, in, actually it's the opposite. You know what happened? The people 
the Sunni, the non-Shia, were in such need of the knowledge of those individuals. That's what the legacy of our sixth Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa was. A few things for you and I to take away. A few things to reflect on when we talk about the legacy of Imam and what it means to us in the application of our own lives. If Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam was achieving so much and was sending fuqaha and ulama around the entirety of the ummah, what do you think that the enemies of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam wanted to do to him? And of course you know the answer. The caliph of his time was the accursed Mansur al-Dawaniki, the one who would eventually martyr Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. According to history, Mansur tried five times to be able to martyr Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. On one of the occasions, Mansur tells his henchmen to burn down the house of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam is running in and out of the house, trying to put the fire out. Can you imagine him trying to gather his family members, drag them out of a burning house to safety? After he manages to be able to put the fire out, he is seen sitting down on the side of the road, crying and weeping. His companions come to him and say, Ya ibn Rasulullah, we didn't think that you would cry over an attack by Mansur. We didn't think that you would cry over maybe losing your material possessions. Why are you crying so much? To which the Imam responds by saying, I'm not crying because... I have lost anything inside the house. I am crying because finally I really understood what my auntie Zainab in Umm Kulthum suffered on the night of the 11th of Muharram. Can you imagine the scene on the night of the 11th of Muharram? We are talking about that when the children are trying to escape from tents that are set ablaze, the enemies, people like Khuli, people like Shimr, would enter into those tents and they would slap the children across the face who were trying to flee from those tents. Our Dhakirin and poets tell us that one of them came and snatched the earrings from the ears of Sayyidina Ruqayya to which she could only shout out and say, if you had just asked me for my earrings, we would have given them to you. Can you imagine the scene? where the children are running out in the darkness of the night. This is a battlefield strewn with broken weapons. There are broken swords. There are broken spearheads. There are arrows everywhere. There are thorn bushes everywhere. Can you imagine a four-year-old child like Ruqayya running out into the darkness of the night and falling over onto broken swords? Can you imagine a three-year-old Imam al-Baqir running out into the darkness of the night? Can you imagine the great-grandchildren of Rasulullah just trying to escape in any direction in which they can? This is why later on, Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam tells Sayyidina Zainab bin Umm Kulthum, gather the children because they have fled in different directions. We don't know where they are. We don't know how many of them are injured. Gather the children back together and bring them. This is what Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam was remembering as he was sitting down on the side of his house. This is what Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam was weeping over. But this was just one of the five times in which they attempted to kill Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. The last one was the one that was successful in its plot. Mansur had given Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam some poison inside that fruit. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam eats from it. 
and eventually he is succumbed to his bed. It is said that Imam Sadiq alayhi salam spent three days whilst he was lying on his deathbed suffering from that poison that was going through his body and amongst his final words were tell my Shia that they will not receive my intercession so long as they take their salah lightly and this was amongst the last words of Imam al-Sadiq before he passed away from this world ala la'natullahi ala al-qawmi al-dhalimeen وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أيهم قلبيا قريبون إن لله وإن إليه راجعون. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to hasten the appearance of Imam Al Mahdi عليه السلام to allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death. If we are to pass away from this world before his coming, Ya Allah, raise us from our graves so that we can partake in the victories of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask you, Ya Allah, grant us the ziyarah of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam fi dunya wal akhirah. We ask you, Ya Allah, whatever our hajat are, accept them bi haqqi Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. And we uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to be able to understand the knowledge and the significance of the movement of the time of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In honor of our sixth Imam, please conclude this discussion with three loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah. Allah. Allah.